commissioners. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Nice to have you here with us. And welcome to a regular meeting of the City of Morro Bay Planning Commission, October 3rd, 2023. We are in the Veterans Memorial Building tonight. And let me introduce the commissioners to you. My name is, uh, I'm Chairperson William Roshan. My Vice Chair, Mike Rodriguez. Let me introduce Commissioner Joseph Ingrafia, Commissioner Asia King, and Commissioner Eric Meyer. We're happy to be here with you, and thanks for being with us. And for all those that are on the Zoom call, thank you for being with us, too. Um, I've established a quorum, so I'll call the meeting to order. And if uh, we could, we'll have a moment of silence. Thank you all, and uh, now if we could do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioners, are there any planning commissioner announcements? Yes. Uh, chair, uh, I just Mike, please. Uh, yeah, I'd like, I'd just like to say thank you to the chair for setting up the council planning commission meeting last week and helping run that meeting. I thought it was very productive and I hope we can do it again. Sooner the better, thank you. Thanks for mentioning that, I, I, I concur. <laughs> Um, I do have one quick announcement I'd like to make. And Scott, I think this is an okay time to do it. Um, I did want to um, point to the uh, Morro Bay Matters. Um, this is a flyer put out by the local folks. Um, I read it all the time. It's uh, got a lot of good information in it. Um, this one time I wanted to point out something I think that's not quite accurate. And I'm gonna ask Scott to opine on it as well. But um, there is a, a brief article on the objective design standards commissioners, which we all did. And the article explains that the objective design standards will allow administrative approval, which in brackets means no public review or comment on three or more story buildings for certain multifamily developments. Um, the objective design standards, in my estimation, and I'm asking commissioners, your understanding, they don't allow for that. Um, the no public review is state law. And if it happens, it happens under state law, not because of the objective design standards. So this might likely go in front of city council. And I wanna make sure that there's not a confusion and Scott, can I ask, am I saying the right things on this? Uh, yeah, Chair, yes, Chair Roshan. Um, so um, interesting topic. Certainly it's, it'll be going to uh, the City Council at their next meeting. Uh, the Planning Commission, you know, you, did, you conducted your review and made your recommendation and it's finally making its way toward City Council and they'll have at least two meetings on it, an introduction and second reading, if not more. Um, but yeah, it, it, objective design standards are meant to address, you know, the kind of slew of, uh, you know, housing legislation that's come out of the state to facilitate all different types of housing. And um, most of it is trying to create a situation where it's housing by right. Um, and they will put, give you the one caveat that unless you have objective design standards and you can apply those. And we didn't have those before. Um, and that's why we took it through the process with the commission and, and brought it forward. And it was part of our goals and was part of the, you know, we, we got about $275,000 in uh, grant funding to do housing element implementation. And it was one of the items that we brought forward because we knew we were gonna need this. Yeah. Um, and there's pending legislation right now that, you know, was gonna take advantage of this. And we would be at a disadvantage if we didn't have it in place. Yeah. So we're hoping to get it, you know, put in place by the end of the year. Yeah, and I wanna make sure that the public understands because the, the the guidelines are a help, not not a hindrance. Yeah, we would not have, be able to have a say as it relates to overall design, say with the exception of like a setback or something that is objective that we could apply. Um, and a lot of those standards, as you'll recall, talk about like layouts and designs and upper floor step backs and things like that. 
we don't have those otherwise. And so it wouldn't be a discretionary process. It would be go through, it would be, it would be going through a staff level review process or potentially a planning commission, but you still are not doing it in a public hearing. Got it, so. got it. And commissioners, do you guys agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I have another further comment. Please, um, Eric. It is state law, I, I, but we did point, I, I actually mentioned that the, the, this objective design guidance really only applies to low income housing and multifamily, and in Morro Bay will only happen in very, very rare occurrences, maybe one or two every couple of years, maybe. If ever. If ever. And we did actually, because uh, these low income housing uh, units often have no exterior space, especially if they're upstairs units. There was a, a suggestion I made that should the developer make a larger than required uh, uh, deck, uh, uh, second story deck on one of these low income units that uh, if it was larger than required, it could extend up to two feet over the sidewalk in a commercial district. Um, and that was only in a zero setback commercial district. Uh, and that's just something else I wanted to point out. Okay, thank you. Other commissioners? Scott, thank you. Sure. Let me go then, if we have no other commissioner announcements, let me go to public comment. Uh, this is a chance for anyone here tonight who would like to comment on something that's not on the agenda. Um, you get a chance to go over that, or someone who's on the Zoom call can also uh, call in. Anyone interested in public comment? Uh, guys, do we have anybody in the uh, queue, please? Thank you, Chair Roshan. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. Thank you very much. If that's the case, I will close public comment and we can go to our consent calendar. Um, Scott, I don't think we have anything we need to approve on the consent calendar tonight. It's just a receiving file. Commissioners, if no comments on that, I can move right to our first case. Then let me introduce B1 case number, major modification MAJ23002 to existing permits, CUP21-014 slash CDP21-042. The site is 2900 Alder Avenue in Morro Bay. Nancy, you're on. Thank you. So this is a major modification to a previously approved hotel project. And I think this is a little bit of a post-pandemic situation because at least I'm seeing it more than I did pre-pandemic is that the pandemic changed pricing, changed marketability, changed how people go out, and so I, I'm seeing more modifications for previously approved projects than before. Just a side comment. Um, so I believe all of you were on the Planning Commission when this was in front of you last September, except Commissioner Meyer. This is the site on the corner of San Jacinto between Alder and Birch. So currently approved and permitted is a two-story um, six-room hotel that was approved September 6, 2022. The building size is 4,117 square feet. It's six rooms, six parking spaces, Space. two stories. Story. Some feedback. Back, back. Okay, sorry. Um, and hot the hotel building sorry. is on the north side of the lot and the parking lot in the driveway is on the south portion of the lot along San Jacinto. So this is a comparison. The top uh, view is the new proposed smaller scale, single story, five cottage unit hotel, and the one below is the approved project. Um, comparison in the site plans, the bottom left is the new project. The top right is the previous project. The red line is the site, um, the two Images are to scale with each other. Um, the building footprint for the, s the proposed new project is a little smaller. The new project is 13 feet and a few inches versus 24 feet and a few inches. 
The new project has five rooms, and the new project is offering two EV charging parking spaces, and one is conditioned in the conditions of approval to be a level two. Proposed floor plan of the new project. So you can see they're just about identical. The one to the far left is the ADA accessible unit. All rooms are just under 400 square feet in size. All have a spacious patio area that faces San Jacinto. Uh, the unit on the west, as I mentioned, is ADA accessible. They all have a living room as you enter the unit, um, a hallway back to the bedroom, and the restroom in the center of the floor plan. And the living rooms could be a um, modified or fold out couch to accommodate additional sleeping quarters. So the material board um, is um, shake roof, uh, dark shake roof, vinyl windows. Uh, the cottages will each have a different um, natural color to differentiate each cottage. And then the image on the far bottom right is kind of the inspiration, which is a beach cottage. Uh, in the previous design, there was a lot of discussion about hotel signage, and the signage is the same as was approved in the previous plan, and it um, will also, ha so it has a monument sign on the corner of San Jacinto and Alder, and it'll have the informational sign with the phone number and the um, website on both sides of the property. Landscape was also discussed by the commission a year ago, and this is the same plant palette, the same count, the same container sizes, just reconfigured on the site. Exterior lighting. The exterior lighting has changed. This is a more residential front light fixture um, than the previous lighting, and at the facilities and uh, electronic monitoring devices on the um, property will allow remote management of the hotel day-to-day -day activity, security, lighting, and noise. And that was a condition of the previous project and remains a condition of this modified project. Planning Commission um, conditions of approval. So the major modification conditions include the same conditions as the previously approved project modified as appropriate for the new project related to parking. Previously, there was a parking exception that was valid for a um, space in the front setback. The parking exception in this case is valid for a portion of the ADA angle space in the back that's in the front setback. Landscaping is the same uh, condition. It's installed per plan or requires director approval. Mechanical equipment condition is the same. It requires um, access around all four sides of the building, which is easier with a smaller building, and screening required if it's visible from the street side, which is very likely since there's th three streets surrounding the site. Signage um, is the same condition again. Um, informational sign locations and signage lighting, dark sky compliant was kind of gist of the condition. And um, lighting, lighting levels are to be reviewed at the final building inspection to determine if any adjustments are required in the programming to avoid light spillage and to make sure it's dark sky compliant. Continuing with the Planning Commission's conditions of approval, this um, Approval includes the same condition on no host hotels. And so a summary of those conditions are the hotel room occupancy was limited to two adults per bedroom and two children. Hotel guests may have visitors from the hours of 7 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. and visitors are encouraged to park outside the residential neighborhood. Noise re regulations are in effect 24 seven, but are more restrictive between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Hotel management shall install and maintain electronic monitoring devices to facilitate remote management of the day-to-day -day activities. And hotel management shall engage services of a local licensed property manager with the ability to respond to calls within one hour. 
so that concludes the presentation. The staff recommendation is for approval of the major modification MAJ 23-002 by adopting Planning Commission Resolution 16-23, which includes findings and conditions of approval. Uh, Nancy, thank you. Commissioners, questions for staff? Joe. Um, visitors and uh, I think it's they're really it's omissions on our part. I think from the last time we looked at it, uh, encouraging um, visitors to park outside the residential area. But we 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 never got there's nothing any anything more specific as what the substance of that encouragement will be or or how the uh, the occupants will be informed of that. Um, I think it would be a booking issue. And it would be a recommendation. Public parking is available to anybody. So it's really a courtesy that we're asking the hotel to try to encourage if there's guests to park outside of that neighborhood or the residential portion of the neighborhood. I don't know that it's enforceable. Well, no, no. So, so, so would it would be verbally communicated at the time that, well, electronically, I guess, because. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me, I'm another generation. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the existing noise regulations that are part of city ordinance, some, will they be posted on the sign or, or is this, how, again, we didn't really talk about how that would be communicated. So um, they have monitoring devices that can mount monitor sound. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a little hard to, I guess you could hand someone a municipal code and highlight the noise ordinance. So there's, a, I think, a common understanding of what noise is acceptable and not. Uh, yeah, I, I was getting more to the to the times after which things have to get quieter, and how the tenants. Oh, I that I assume would be on their the, the website where they have kind of rules and requirements. Yeah, so that's that's what we wanted, right? Um, and then I just had a question about the cameras and the mics. Just you know, what would be what would be adequate to monitor a five unit building. And I, I don't know if that's one camera and one microphone or it's microphones at every unit. I, and obviously there are privacy issues involved and I was just wondering if we wanted to. We, we can ask the applicant if they have okay. any intent. All right, that, that was it. Thank you, Joe. Others? Eric. Nancy, if you could just run through the, the differences between uh, a hotel and an unhosted hotel and maybe like a VRBO situation in a residential neighborhood. It's basically a commercial versus residential type of situation. I think there's some maybe questions on the part of the public about that discussion. So I, I think um, the definitions are hotel or commercial enterprises and vacation rentals are residential enterprises that are in someone's home, condo, apartment, um, so that, that's the difference between vacation rental and hotel. The difference between hotel and non-hosted hotel is there's someone standing in the lobby in one, and the other one there's someone on the website delivering information in the trend because we're having more applications come in for non-hosted hotel. That is the trend, and that, that actually is a preference for a lot of hotel guests. And do we have any of these operating in the city or so, uh, other hotels operating as unhosted? We do. And have there been any complaints? They don't complain to me. Or yeah, we haven't we haven't received uh, any that I can think of off the you know offhand. Um, certainly, it's not. We don't have any you know problem children out there, if you will, um, that are you know repeat offenders and things like that. I mean. Uh, I'd have to ask, you know, PD if they've gotten any. I mean, they, you know, they, they've probably responded to every single hotel in town at one time or another. Um, just guys of the nature of what's going on there. And um, so we'd have to ask them to get a, you know, a number related to that for some of the unhosted ones. But again, I think that you know, there's a little bit, you've heard me say this before, blurring of the lines now, you know, with how these are operated. Many of our hotels in town, you know, <clears throat> advertise themselves through things like VRBO, Airbnb, Flipkey. Um, so that's not an uncommon thing, you know, and those are the sort of platforms for platforms, excuse me, for vacation rentals. So, um, you know, I think it's just kind of, you know, that's where things are, are, you know, I guess evolving to at this point. 
Let me follow up on that, because we did get a question from Betty Winholtz mm -hmm. about the definition of a no-host hotel. Um, Scott, I did ask, did you have a chance to research this? Are we, there other cities that have this as part of their zoning code? We, we, we did spend some time. There certainly wasn't a lot of time between the last meeting and this one, but we did um, have uh, one of our interns do some research. And actually, I think Cindy and I did a little bit of, uh, on our own. It didn't really come up with something that that seems, so I don't know if maybe they're called something else in other towns or they simply just regulate them like Nancy was saying, hotels are regulated as commercial entities and then if you have a short-term rental ordinance, short-term rentals are regulated by that, which we do. We have a short-term rental ordinance that tells us how you know we, we regulate those and, and then there's different categories of short-term rentals in our ordinance like commercial ones versus home shares where you're renting out a room or versus regular short-term rentals where it's just the, the, the unit itself, the residential unit. Did you have a chance to reach out to the city attorney to get advice? on the legal um, impacts of, of adding this definition to the zoning code? I did, I did send an email, I haven't gotten a response yet. Okay, so we can put that on the list as a follow-up and maybe the public, when we have public comment, we'll have, yeah. have input as well. Yeah, and just to clarify as well, uh, through the chair that uh, when Betty asked that question, because I wanted to look it up, it was regarding B3, but we're dealing with it now on B1. Right. So it's gonna be consistently an issue, so we might as well deal with it while we can. Thank you. I like that. Um, I have a couple quick questions, Nancy. You mentioned mechanical equipment. Where are, where are the condensers? Where's the mechanical equipment on this project? Uh, on the planning plan, I believe it's on Birch. So it's, um, on, it's mounted on the ground. Adjacent, yes, on the ground adjacent to the unit. Does it show on the plan, do you know? I think it does. But the, the applicant can tell us if, okay. a lot of times on planning plans, they haven't worked out all the mechanical and Got yet, it. so. Well, and last time this was before us, we questioned the signs. Did they submit a sign plan with this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a lighting plan as well? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I'll go Mike? ahead and pick it up from there. Because I'm the one, I believe, who kind of stuck with that signage you know, we wanted to make sure that we had some kind of sign out there that would reference the fact that it was a hotel. And I think, again, we're gonna be dealing with this more. So we wanted to get it right, hopefully this time, that way when the next applicant comes forward, we have the same requirement. So we're trying to build that into our zoning code too. So I just wanna keep on reiterating that. But the, the things when I went through this last night, I was kind of reviewing the first one we approved in this one. And I just wanted to make some general comments. I said spacing between homes. I said, is there a safety and health requirement, you know, some kind of issue that might pop up when we have five homes just literally up against each other. I just thought these are the things I'm noticing, the difference between the first and the second one. It looks like if you look at it a certain way, it just looks like one big continuous home, depending on how you're looking at it right from one view or another, east, west, whatever. So I'm just making observations and seeing if we can improve on some of these things. And then it's, uh, so it looks like a big home. In some cases it can look like that. Did we have, do we have any other developments like this where we have literally back to back to back to back to back, to back homes? We, we have several old, this is sort of designed like an old mo motor court motel. That's okay. the design here. Okay. Um, and we do have those in various locations around town. Many of them have been converted and they're actually residential now. Okay. Um, but yeah, we do have them. Okay, I just want to make sure. And then uh, signage. The last thing I had was signage and we got it in there. So that's all. Just general observations. If no further questions for staff, let me invite the applicant up. If you could introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Garav Khanna. You can call me Bobby. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, the creative process is never a straight line. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and the economy has changed so substantially. Um, we decided to redesign the project. Um, I think it came out a lot better. Um, it's, you know, we, we had the idea of uh, beach cottages and I drove by the site today and, you know, um, I think it would um, really fit the area very nicely. So, um, yeah, uh, happy to answer any questions and I'm hopeful that you'll approve the project. 
Yeah, and just to make an observation before I open up to questions, um, you're taking a story off that's going to be less impact mm -hmm. on the neighborhood. Um, I do have one question. You're showing a sawtooth roof, and I want to make sure that you intend to follow through on that. Um, so it's not just a mansard in the front, but those are real volumetric sawtooths. That's what the rendering shows. I wanna make sure you're committing to that because that's a little more difficult to drain and get the water off the roof. Yes, yeah, we, we I mean, we w went really detailed with the plan. So, you know, it does have a minimal, um, I believe it's like a one foot back slope from the front that's going all the way to the back. So, and then the roof plan basically yeah. uh, sort of structures the, the water. Yeah, it's, it's handsome, thanks. Other questions? I just wanted to say, you know, in Morro Bay, if you live here for some, for some time, just north of Dorns was this motel called the Log Cabins, and the Log Cabins had this sawtooth roof just like this, and it reminds me of the Log Cabins, and I sort of c congratulate you on c just following the motif of that vintage style. I think it's appropriate. My only comment. Others? Uh, questions for the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to uh, invite the public up to comment on the project. If there's anybody who has an opinion and would like to contribute. Terry, welcome. Good evening, we, Chair. Can we put three minutes on the clock, yeah, for Terry? Yeah, I'll make it, make it nine minutes. Mm -hmm. It might take longer. Okay. <laughs> um, I, too, think that the project is vastly improved. Uh, both from a constructability, management, and um, desirability in the neighborhood. Um, I think it's going to be much less impactful, uh, particularly on the adjacent neighbor, uh, with the exception of the parking lot. And to that extent, I have some, hopefully, some constructive criticism of the parking lot. Typically, when we do these diagonal parking lots, you, at the short end of the diagonal, you normally have a wheel stop 30 inches back from that inside corner. If you come out 30 inches and then go perpendicular across the parking space, you can develop a very nice landscape trapezoid in that area going down there. And I think since this parking lot is shown as being built right up to the fence line, I think that'd be a wonderful opportunity to soften the impacts through some nice landscaping, hopefully some tall landscaping uh, on the next door neighbor's project. So just a thought. Um, the front of the building, I share the concern about the flatness of it. And using the Marengo precedent, I would suggest that the applicant would apply for an abandonment of that strip of the public right-of-way between where he's currently showing his sidewalk and the back of curb to allow the sidewalk to move all the way around to back of curb and then take advantage of what's going to basically be a dead public green space. Nancy, can we pull up the plan? Um, that won't be, unless it's mandated to be maintained by this property owner, is technically the responsibility of the city. Whereas if that green space gets moved in, inboard, then it could be easily incorporated in this property's landscaping. Once one does that, there's an, an opportunity, albeit may not be that cost beneficial, to not only have the vertical sawtooth, but also to have a planar sawtooth where each one of the units as you move from west to east could step a couple of feet further towards the street. I think this would make a much more interesting front facade. And technically, each one of those units could become a little larger. Or one of the things that I see as most missing in this project, because it's going to be outsourced for all of its operation and maintenance, is some form of on-site storage particularly for linens and towels and all the kinds of things, the cleaning products and stuff that the people coming to clean and remake these rooms are going to need to expect them to bring all of that stuff with them versus having it delivered and stored at what would be the backs of these residents in some storage areas. If you gain that additional footage by moving each one of these units closer to the street, um, I think would be a real benefit. That's my thoughts. Terry, thank you. Others? Uh, is there anyone in the queue? Thank you, Chair Roshan. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. 
Last chance, no one else wants to talk. I'll close the public hearing. Um, public comment period, I mean. Um, commissioners, this is your chance to opine. Who would like to start? Eric? I like Terry's idea of the sawtooth on the, on, on the vertical. Uh, that's a, that's it's a, uh, just basically up to the city and whether the city will abandon uh, and if this, and the, the time taken that it would take to do that process, I would ask staff to opine on. <laughs> I mean, it's something that has to be discussed with the public works mm -hmm. engineering division. Um, I don't know, there's probably a lot of desire to do that given the location, narrowing the street there. Um, so it would just kind of depend on what the overall build out there was supposed to look like. But um, I could see that not being something of real interest on the city side of things. But I would have to defer again to our Public Works Department, City Engineering Division. The, the uh, air conditioning, by the way, you're asking is in the trash containment area on the east side of the property, as far as I can tell. It's, I can't read it. Is that the? Uh, it's not on that. It's not on that. It's, it's in the plans here. I'm looking at the plan set. Okay. It is on the same side as the trash container, but not in the. It's oh. it's a flatter unit compressor unit halfway down the building. Okay. It opens up onto the street. That, that's my... I guess I'd follow up with what Eric said. I do think, uh, and I think it's quite common to see planters on the diagonals like uh, Terry was referring to. Um, and right now they're not showing any landscape along that edge. So that seems like a good idea to me. I don't think it's really a public works issue. The other thing that looks missing is there's no curb protection for that back stucco wall. So when those cars back up, uh, it's likely to damage uh, that wall because there's no protection. So m most commonly you would see a, a curb come out there um, to make sure that the, you know, the tire gets stopped before the car hits the stucco wall. So I think I'd probably suggest those two things. The, um, the observation that there is no storage on site, maybe we could, we could invite you up, Bobby. Um, that does make this seem more like a vacation rental than a hotel. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, we have a, um, we have a plan for that. I, I believe we have bollards. Um, but they might not be on this plan. And, and you know, this is a, a planning plan, so, uh, you know, we might not have the... Yeah, I mean, it's course. important because it's going to encroach of in the course. driveway and then all of a sudden you don't have enough clearance. And, and you know, our, um, our sort of uh, objective was to really just uh, meet the spacing requirements. We didn't, you know, add the details of, like, car stops and things like that, but those would, of course, be there. As for the storage, we would just, uh, in the fenced area, have a outdoor cabinet no, I don't think so <laughs> <laughs> that was the um, that was the the plan basically but I mean for the most part that is like unclear whether yeah, it's actually I mean you don't just have an outdoor storage thing no. well you know in, in terms of actually operating it's unclear how much it's actually needed because of our laundry plan and we spoke to, uh, you know, several laundry companies in the surrounding area. And so it does seem, you know, to be able to be coordinated that linens would be immediately taken from the site and new linens immediately right. brought at the same time. Right. Which is different and than a hotel. A hotel. Right. Yeah. And then as for cleaning supplies, it's, it's actually very typical for a cleaning crew to bring, you know, their, their supplies with them. And yeah, carry which them is around. different than a hotel, but yes. Yeah. So we... <laughs> you know, didn't particularly see all that much need for uh, on-site storage. And, you know, there might be like minor, but. Got it. Other questions? Eric, the, uh, the EV chargers are currently shown on the outside edges of the property. So the, the only site, the only, one, only the you know, ADA site is next to an EV charger. And that seems like an inconvenient choice. Um, it would seem to be that perhaps at the front of the ADA um, pedestrian space on the, on the right-hand side of the ADA space would be the spot to put one of the chargers there. 
uh, and the other one is probably fine. The one on the east side is probably fine. It's the one on the west side that I'm concerned about. And I'm also, as usual, concerned about EV chargers that are level one. They're basically pointless, and I would suggest that we go level two on both of them. Um, but other than that, I have no comments. Others? Mike? Joe, last chance. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to thank you for this latest design. It's, it's much less imposing than the first one was, and, and I think more compatible with the, with the neighborhood, particularly uh, departure from those uh, carports on the ground floor and all that. Um, I do have a bit of a concern in terms of the, uh, what is it, the uh, east and west facades, which strike me as very, very unarticulated, and I realize there's going to be landscaping, but it's always with landscaping, it's a question of when will the landscaping develop, how much will it conceal, and will it survive? And I, I would like to see some effort to increase the articulation on those facades because they are clearly visible as that they, they border streets. This is not an example of where much of the uh, interior facade is going to be concealed by an existing building, that won't be the case. And and I, if, I, if windows were added, I mean, that would be a nice amenity to those two end units, bringing in more light and it's easy to do. Well, I, I, I can, I, can, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to apply on, on what sort of thing because I, I would imagine, you know, privacy becomes an issue as well, and, and et cetera, but I, I think something needs to be done to break up whatever it is, those long facades. Asia. <coughs> yeah, so um, going back to some of the things we talked about last time with noise and visitors, time of day and number of occupants, um, there I've been in other cities at similar sort of um, hotels that have this extra step of um, requiring something um, signed in person at the hotel room um, with that kind of forces the person, the visitor, to acknowledge each mm. individual condition. And I don't know how practical that is, but um, I know it puts like an extra awareness or an extra weight instead of being able to just like scan to the end of a website and click that you've read the terms and conditions and you agree it puts it kind of in a physical copy. I recognize that also adds extra uh, hands-on work at the hotel, but it might be, I've seen it done other places successfully to highlight the terms of um, whatever we've added on here for the visitor. So that could potentially be an option to kind of help um, residents feel better that at least visitors know the lay of the land. Um, I know it says on there two adults um, per bedroom and two children, and I was just wondering if we can bump that to three children. Hmm. Um, that's one question. That I would advocate for that, hmm. especially because there are the couches that turn into beds. Um, and then I wanted to ask, staff about the storage options questions. If um, this is approved as is, what are, um, what does, what's currently allowed in that area for like sheds or uh, movable storage sheds? Like what would they be allowed to do? Um, this is a pretty there? tight site. So I would say uh, when they're doing building permits, if they can find an area, carve a space out of one of the rooms, something, but but the proposal was that they were gonna use a laundry service, so there wasn't going to be items stored on site. It would be kind of like the mission uniform truck showing up with all the new uniforms and taking old uniforms out. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering like, if in the future they are like, oh shoot, we do need something, um, what could we expect to come up? They would have to propose something to us, you know, we have to take a look at it. I, I, I'm sure, you know, the, the moment you 
put something outside like that, it's an attractant um, for people to try to get into. So it seems unlikely that they would actually go down that road to me. But I mean, this is a commercial project. I mean, th those kinds of sheds are residential backyard mm -hmm. things. Not it, yeah, I, I agree. I don't, but it wouldn't be appropriate. So it would have to be something that becomes part of the sort of the building. It needs to look like part of it. And quite frankly, I, I don't, I don't anticipate it based on the comments from the applicant. I don't think that's what they're interested in. I think it's small enough to where they can certainly have, you know, laundry and cleaning services come out and take care of them and probably pretty quickly is my guess because the, 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 they're not all that large, so. Okay. And then just my final comments. I, I appreciate that the parking's in the back. I think it does a lot for that walkway. I know lots of families in the neighborhood that actually walk down to Cloisters Park from through this light and so just adds a nice um, sidewalk and a nicer walk to a park. So I appreciate the parking being in the back. But I also agree that some kind of making sure there's some kind of uh, cement or landscaping barrier between the adjacent property and the parking would be really helpful. Um, and then I also actually support Joe's comment about more articulation on the west or with the landscaping on the west and east. Facade. Uh, thank you, Asia. Other comments? Mm -hmm. Anyone interested in making a motion? I think your window idea is a good idea, but I would, I don't necessarily, I don't think we should design from the, from the di dais, but, but some sort of articulation is, is desirable, I think, on those east and west facades. And I think the windows, w additional windows would be the easiest solution. Do you want to make a motion? And well, I have, I have a question for Asia with respect to the special signing online that you wanted to, do you have the points that you wanted to have them sign on? Oh, to be in person rather than just online, the terms and conditions. Well, you said there was something, there was, uh, yes, in, in, in addition to just signing off on the, online, the terms and conditions. To have the terms and conditions available in unit to be signed how I've seen it done is you have to like sign when you get to the unit, each term and condition, you make you have a little signature saying that you've read it and that copy's kept by the owner. Online though, because there's nobody there, there's nobody to hand them the terms and conditions. I mean, that's I've seen it done on online only hotels, online booking only hotels where it's in the unit. I mean, certainly when they get a unit ready for the next guest, they just leave it on the, on the front table. Yeah, it's an extra way of posting terms and conditions. I don't know, what do you guys think? You've not seen this? Yeah. It kind of adds like a little like, you're signing this paper, this is your what you gotta agree to do kind of thing. Is this typically something that would come from the Planning Commission? I, I mean, it, it, it's... It's the it, terms and conditions that we put that they would, that they would follow noise so, so I, I mean, I guess what I would say to the um, Chair Roshan's um, question to me um, is that no, it's not simply something we would typically have. Um, I, I, the physical paper thing when they don't have somebody there to hand it to, I'm not really sure how that would work. Um, I, I also think like, most of the hotels and we have in town function just fine. We don't have a lot of issues with noise and those types of things. Certainly if it's a concern of the commission, they could do something like the online version of it where they sign off on those things. I mean, that seems to be in keeping with the type of project that's in front of you. Um, you know, short of that, it would be something like Nancy said, and they could have it left on the table, but I don't know, like the owners not of the hotel or the operators aren't getting that until they leave, so I don't. Is it reasonable to make make it a condition that would be resolved to satisfaction of staff? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with that. We could talk with- So we could add models. it as a condition. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or just yeah. some kind of, maybe a better way is just some kind of posting. Oh, well, the, the applicant and staff can work it out if you're willing to yeah. allow that. Yeah, I was just looking for- That you would ask, you would ask staff to resolve it. Okay, who wants to make the motion? All right. S another follow-up for Asia's questions about the two versus three mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I would tend to agree with that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so it just allows a certain number of families. I'm not, do we make that a condition though? 
You, you have one right now that limits it to two. Yeah. Right? Does yeah. staff have any comment on that change? That was a planning commission added condition. I know, but any, oh, <laughs> previous, previous round. Yeah. Bobby, any response? Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. Yeah. So I, I always make a motion then um, <laughs> that uh, we approve. I'm not going to go through the numbers yet. I'm going to make the, the, mm -hmm. the, the points. In addition to everything that's already stated by staff, we would I would ask for uh, two level two chargers uh, for, for the uh, electric cars, uh, additional windows, or some other device on the east and west facades to the and as a friendly amendment we're making these conditions to be resolved by staff um, rather they don't Correct. need to come back Correct. to us all right uh, I would ask for Terry's suggestion of landscaping in the triangle areas uh, I would ask to change from two to three children and then I would ask for uh, some sort of special s online signing uh, rather than in-person signing when they sign up that they, they, they agree to the conditions to staff satisfaction uh, and if that's amenable to everybody i'll second that uh, uh, I'm not i have one friendly amendment yeah, yeah. Um, i do want to emphasize that um, i would hate to see the sawtooth changed at a later date for a flat roof so i would i would insist that it's a um, uh, an expectation of approval so that they the stay with the, the sawtooth. Yeah, the, the best part about it is, um, you've mentioned it a couple of times here, when, whenever, whenever um, I'll just give you a little bit of background on how this works. So whenever uh, somebody comes forward and wants to make a change to a project and how we often determine whether that's a major or minor modification is if it's relatively insignificant and it's not something the planning commission talked about, staff level. Mm -hmm. The moment they start wanting to change things, the planning commission spoke to at the meeting, that's a major modification pretty much no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. Nice. And I would just ask the motion include it. So it's vi vividly clear. And I'd also say no, uh, no uh, sheds. I think doing a shed at this project would be a detriment to the neighborhood and the project. And to go in there with that idea is, um, I they, would they say. They don't have the, sorry. Go ahead. They don't have the, it's all, it's all setbacks they couldn't put a set a shed in a setback anyway so well then let's just say to be clear no independent sheds on the, on the site so that's a friendly amendment if yeah. you, you will so, still so I'll just restate because that was a lot of discussion mm -hmm. um, just uh, I would move a recommendation to, uh, to the City Council for the approval of, sorry wrong one mm -hmm. Here we go. thanks uh, I recommend that we conditionally approve the project by adopting Planning Commission Resolution 16-22, which includes the findings for MAJ 23-003 that will allow the proposed modifications to the previously approved hotel as reflected on the plan submitted to the City of Morro Bay on August 7, 2023, uh, with the additional inclusion of two level two chargers uh, additional windows or some other uh, facade uh, device that, that makes those facades more interesting and, uh, on the east and west side uh, with the addition of landscaping and the triangles with the change from two to three children allowed uh, with the special signing online that we discussed and with the sawtooth roof being part of the design. And I second that again. And, and no sheds. And no sheds. No sheds yeah. And it just one clarification, um, you said resolution 16-22 and it's 16-23. I no. just misspoke, I, don't, okay. I apologize. And uh, as a second of the motion, I would just clarify that staff will resolve all the additions that was, were discussed, that will be resolved at staff level. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we have a first and a second. Um, Bobby, let me thank you. I think it's a nice project. Um, I think it's an improvement and we appreciate your efforts and thanks for listening to us. Uh, would you poll the commission, please? Commissioner Ingrafia? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Chairperson Roshan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Um, I'm ready to go to the next case, commissioners. Are we good? Yep.
Uh, I'd like to introduce B2, which is case number CDP 23-008 slash CUP 23-08. This is 2772 Indigo Circle in Morro Bay. And our planner is Susanna, and um, let me welcome Susanna. It's nice to have you. You've been with us for a while, but this is the first time I think you've been with us at Planning Commission, and you're now a full-time employee, I understand. Yes, I was the intern, um, planning intern for about a year, and I've been the assistant planner for a couple months now. Uh, really nice to have you, and congratulations. You're a, a recent graduate as well, right? Yes, class of 2023. Yes, good We're job. We're very excited to have her. And it never works out when, uh, you know, you have somebody leave and then there's somebody waiting in their place to take a <laughs> position. So that was awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome. We're really happy to have you, too. So you're on. Okay. Terry? Oh, Thank you, Chairman Roshan, and good evening, Planning Commissioners and members of the public. The project before you tonight is a request for a coastal development permit and conditional use permit to build a new single-family home on a vacant parcel at 2772 Indigo Circle in the northern cluster of the Cloister subdivision. The property owners and applicants are Becky Clark and Tom Moore. The agent is David Farron. The site is zoned CRR slash GC with a PD overlay. The lot is located within the Coastal Appeals jurisdiction. This is an image of the existing 8,084 square foot parcel as seen from Indigo Circle that gives the context of the site as it currently sits. The project as designed meets all applicable development standards from the city's zoning ordinance. This is a site plan that illustrates the proposed 2,491 square foot single family home with a 559 square foot attached garage and a 192 square foot guest house. The site plan also shows the garage design behind the proposed guest house to meet the standards set forth in the Cloisters design guideline. This is the floor plan of the proposed residence showing the garage between the residence and the guest house. I have also provided the landscaping plan, which shows drought tolerant plants, sandstone gravel lock, and stand, sandstone flagstone. These are the photo simulations of the proposed development that show the architectural details, colors, and materials of the design. As you can see, the project is a bungalow sti bungalow like style home with wood siding that complies with the Cloisters design guidelines. As discussed, this project is designed to meet the requirements in the Cloisters design guidelines. The Cloisters Architectural Review Committee also wrote a letter confirming the project's compliance. As for the city's approved residential design guidelines, the project is compliant in regarding scale and mass as it meets the height and lot coverage requirements. The single family home is consistent with the coastal nature of the Cloisters property. The proposed home meets the proportional relationship requirements related to scale and mass. Oops, sorry, this one. Uh, surface articulation, the proposed project is proposing varying ridge heights, wall planes, and colors, and materials to provide visual interest. Building orientation, like other homes in the cloisters, the entry and driveway are visible and inviting with a side-facing garage door. Garage and driveway design, the dark framed garage door matches other materials used throughout the home exterior and does not face the street. Sustainable design features. The plants proposed are all low water plant species. Outdoor lighting fixtures shall be pointed downward and shielded. The home is also proposing to include roof mounted solar panels. Building materials. The proposed materials comply with the cloister's design guidelines, such as stucco siding as the primary material, 
wood and horizontal ribbed siding as accent materials, and board foam concrete with a dimensional asphalt shingled roof. Architectural elements, the design and architectural features are visually pleasing as well as the colors used in the exterior finishes. The bungalow style home proposes a similar look and feel to other homes in the Cloisters subdivision. Landscaping, the landscaping plan is compliant to the 50% required front setback landscaping standards, proposing low and drought tolerant native plant species typical to the area with no irrigation proposed. Therefore, it is staff recommendation to adopt resolution 12-23, which includes the findings and conditions of approval for permit numbers CDP 23-008 and CUP 23-08 for the proposed single family residence at 2772 Indigo Circle. Thank you. Yes, Susanna, thank you very much. Very nice for your first, first uh, <laughs> presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Staff questions, commissioners. <coughs> None, thank you very much. Is the applicant here tonight? Um, welcome, if you would introduce yourself. Hello, uh, commissioners and staff. I'm David Farron, I'm the architect and applicant. I'm here with Becky Clark and Tom Moore, the, uh, my clients, and we're very excited to be here, um, and hopefully we can move forward with our project. Um, it's a very intricate design that um, a lot of thought was put in to fit into the neighborhood and also to satisfy the needs of these very special people. So uh, let me know if you have any questions and we look forward to your comments. Great, any questions for the architect? Mike? No, I don't have any questions. Oh, no questions. I was looking at you, but I wasn't gonna ask. Oh, <laughs> you faked me out there. No, no takers? No. no, no. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite the public to come up. Is there anyone who uh, would like to comment on the project? Thank goodness you're here, Terry. Thanks. Thank goodness I'm here. You'd be so lonely without me. <laughs> um, I, I think the project is attractive. I think it's uh, very consistent with the neighborhood standards and obviously the Cloisters people thought it was okay. I do have some uh, cautionary words. Um, it's not real clear to me um, what this front fence and or wall is all about. Uh, it looks, in one drawing it looks like it's a fence, in another drawing it looks like it's a masonry wall. Um, and Can we put up speak, that slide? Well, This speaks to Coastal Commission <coughs> issues. Um, recently had some issues with uh, anticipated sea level rise floor elevations. And looking at this, mm. again, just with the submittal, drawings, it looks like the floor elevations of this building are actually lower than the adjacent building. I would, if I were the architect, I'd be very concerned about verifying future sea level rise elevations per the Coastal Commission and also whether this, whatever wall or fence it is, um, could be construed to be some sort of uh, protection, site protection, which the Coastal Commission is adamantly opposed to. Other than that, I think it's a nice project. Terry, thank you. <clears throat> anyone else you'd like to comment? Is there anyone in the clue, in the queue? Thank you, Chair Roshan. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. Thank you very much. With that, I will close the public comment period. Commissioners, your turn. Comments, questions, motions. Eric. <clears throat> I usually have something to say. I don't have anything to say. You guys did a great job. I think this plan is, like you said, a lot of articulation. It's, Beautiful. Mike. Yeah, I'd like to ditto uh, my fellow commissioner and just state that the only thing I'm gonna miss is seeing that area there with nothing on it. Because every time I come to town, I take a trip there and it's gonna be gone, that vacant spot, but I look forward to what's being built. I think you guys did an outstanding job putting it up, but I'd like to make a motion. You wanna yeah. just go around? Okay, go ahead. We'll hold, we'll hold your spot. Okay, no problem. Joe. <coughs> Oh, I, I love the design. I, I like that it's a little bit of a departure from the more traditional homes that are in the cloisters, and, and I, I love that aspect of it as well. Well done, so I have nothing to praise. Asia. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to get the um, comments from the cloisters design committee. Mm -hmm. um, that was really helpful. 
And I also, I appreciate that this is, you know, infill housing on a vacant lot that mm -hmm. is being used, so thank you. Um, I'll add, uh, I'm an architect, so I really do like good architecture. And so thank you to the owners for supporting the architect. And you've got a nice mm -hmm. project and welcome. Are, are you in Morro Bay now or? Yeah. yeah. So you'll be moving here? Well, welcome. Mm -hmm. I hope, I, I, I like the project and um, I think the commission does. Mm -hmm. So Mike, I'm ready for. Yeah. A I'm ready for a motion. So this may be for Susanna too. So I'm gonna approve you know, uh, make a motion to, that the Planning Commission approve resolution 17-23 and then go to the back saying here that we also approve the development permit CDP 23-008 and conditional use permit CUP 23-08 for the project proposed at 2772 Indigo. That's my motion. Do so I, 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 I took the resolution from page one and then I went to the the end and did the rest. So I don't know if they should all be together, but I put them together. Do I get a second from this sign? I will second that. All right, so I have a motion from Mike and Joe is a second. And uh, any final comments? Um, and thank you very much for, for having the architect here. The previous project, they never bring their architect. Mm -hmm. I always feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just think it shows a, a more of a commitment and, um, and, and integrity. So thank you all. Would you poll the commission? Commissioner Ingravia? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes, and you get a high five. Good job. <laughs> Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Chairperson Roshan? Yes, and they won't always be this easy. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to take a five minute break and we'll resume with the uh, zoning code. You know, we didn't even ask her any questions. No, we should have asked one.
commissioners, are we ready to start? Anthony and Ray, are we good in the back? We are ready. I'd like to resume and I would like to introduce case number, this is B3, Plan Morrow Bay Zoning Code slash Implementation Plan Amendment slash General Plan Local Coastal Program, Coastal Land Use Plan Map Amendment and Zoning Map Amendment. This is citywide. And with that, let me turn it over to staff. Good evening, Chairperson Roshan and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, yes, this is a continued public hearing from the September 19th meeting. And at that meeting, the Planning Commission discussed um, a proposed amendments to the city's zoning code uh, implementation plan that included uh, edits requested by the Coastal Commission as part of our LCP amendment application, as well as some cleanup uh, edits by the city. It also included uh, land use and zoning map amendments to correct some technical errors with two parcels at Dog Beach. And then we did no, uh, duly notice for tonight as a public hearing, uh, some land use and zoning map amendments to Preston Lane uh, properties that I'll discuss in a future slide. Um, for tonight, um, we'll also go over the Planning Commission's review and recommendations that were made at the September 19th public hearing. Um, and then again, of course, the uh, map amendments. Okay, all right, okay. Making sure I have the correct sides here. Um, the Planning Commission gave five, um, uh, a combination of recommendations and requests for clarifications that were um, itemized in the staff report. Uh, the first one was to change the maximum height in the downtown community commercial zone uh, from the 37 feet that was <coughs> excuse me, that was approved with the council's adoption in November of 22 to 30 feet. Um, and that, amend that edit has been made and the zoning amendments ad adoption draft of the zoning code is online at the Plan Moro Bay website. Um, and there are two versions, one that shows the track change edits and one that shows it in clean version. And I'm just restating that for the record for tonight's hearing. And, um, and just for the record, that's the city's website, uh, backslash plan MB. Uh, the second change um, or a consideration by planning commission uh, was to change, um, uh, consider put the potential for changing uh, the downtown community commercial areas to zero foot setbacks. And I'm, I do have a slide here. So as I talk, I'm going to show you what this looks like. So in the, Previous 1997 zoning code, um, that is the slide on the left, and the two red arrows are pointing to uh, some parcels where the zoning changed from, at the, the top left red arrow, it changed from commercial visitor serving to the pink um, on the right-hand side is what was adopted in the zoning code, and that is reflects the community commercial zone. Uh, there were also some changes to, if you look at the bottom left, arrow, bottom left red arrow, uh, that shows the uh, duplex residential zone and on the bottom right, um, some of those parcels were changed to a mixture of community, excuse me, commercial visitor serving and transitional mixed use. Um, in this instance, um, the Planning Commission at the last meeting talked about in, in relation to the 1050 Morrow project that was discussed that night about whether or not it, um, deserves consideration to change the setbacks. Uh, staff's recommendation in regards to this, and we're, and we're outlining with this uh, map here, uh, to show you uh, there are a small number of parcels where the zone would change, um, but because of some ramifications related to there are existing buildings with existing zero foot setbacks, um, staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission uh, keep the setbacks as it is and instead incorporate this into the downtown design district and then Planning Commission can have a, a, a full review um, in that uh, setting. So the downtown design district would consider setbacks as part of their uh, recommendations mm -hmm. and that it could be approved as part of the downtown design district. Yeah, so we, we, we think that's, that, that's 
care rush. We think that that's probably the best process because there's a lot more going on here than just the setbacks at the corner for that project that you saw at 1051. Got it. Um, it, there are a number of properties that would be affected by making the change that the Planning Commission talked about at the last meeting, and we would need to notice those. And you would probably want to look and see what the existing setbacks are for those. It would need some work to be done, and, and that's, that's probably not a decision to be sort of made lightly, I think. And uh, given that the uh, Downtown Design District uh, Committee is looking at a lot of things in the downtown, this seems like a good one to add to the mix. And there might be notifications involved as well, right? Yes. Thank you, sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Um, item number three that was discussed by the commission at the last meeting uh, related to visual resource protection policies uh, in chapter 17.14. This is a chapter that's part of the city's implementation plan, so it's subject to the requirement to be certified by the Coastal Commission. Um, the comment at that meeting was to seek some clarification on why the text read within scenic areas. Um, and this is a really carry forward language from the previous zoning code. It implements our general plan LCP policies. Um, um, the project specific visual impacts, uh, when we see projects, they, we address them through design guidelines and via the application submittal checklist. And so um, the within scenic areas is something that's requested by Coastal because they have that um, standard for the implementation plan. Um, number four, LED lighting. Uh, this was um, a comment that I believe uh, was addressed by Commissioner Meyer and it related to LED lighting on the Embarcadero. Uh, staff looked into this and in regards to the um, whether or not LED lighting um, should or should not have LED, excuse me, LEED certification as the metric for determining whether or not LED lighting should be allowed. Um, uh, staff uh, review determined that um, we do have illumination standards that are addressed citywide in all sign districts, um, but should the commission have some further desire to look into this, um, staff included in the staff report um, that, um, and it's shown here in the um, teal color that um, should the commission be interested to uh, revise this uh, sign policy to include the um, item that's underlined and in bold font which would add illumination proposed is a low lumens warm temperature light. Um, and I'll leave that for um, later during the commission's discussion. Um, and then the fifth one was um, a request to include live work and a work live definition. Um, staff did include definitions in the staff report. Um, we obtained some definitions from cities of Slow and Atascaro regarding live work. Uh, they had a different way of addressing that. And so we included those policies um, for your um, review and discussion. And then regarding work live definition, um, really uh, what we found uh, was the city of Santa Rosa tends to use the term interchangeably and it relates to what proportion of the use is predominant, whether it's work live or live work. Um, and so uh, really not enough time uh, since the last meeting to really kind of like dive in and determine what would be um, most appropriate for Morro Bay. And so um, we included the definitions in the staff report for your uh, review and discussion. And then um, these next two slides are really um, a repeat of what we discussed last time, but since the project does involve land use and zoning map amendments, I uh, included them in the presentation. Um, as I said earlier, um, there were some technical errors in relation to the parcels at Dog Beach. Um, and we, uh, with this, with the Planning Commission's action, should you uh, choose to carry this forward to the City Council, it would correct the Dog Beach um, errors. And then uh, regarding Preston Lane, just wanted to clarify this a little bit more. Um, because we, ha we have some additional detail from the last meeting. So what you're seeing on the screen here, the top two panels are the adopted and the proposed land use map. And the bottom two panels are the, show the adopted zoning map and the proposed zoning. And we did get a question from the property owner of these properties and, I, and I've also talked to them by, by phone. So one thing I just wanna note for the record is that uh, the changes the way that the city's land use and zoning map are, are relate to assessor parcel numbers or APN numbers. Um, these maps show the underlying aerial images, 
Um, and it's important to note that this, these are not dimension maps, they're not to scale, so um, what looks like, excuse me, um, what looks like um, uses that might be in residential versus industrial, um, it's just a uh, general approximation. And so uh, the purple in these images represents the industrial land use and industrial residential zoning, sorry, industrial zoning, and the yellow um, for clarification shows residential. On the land use map, there were some technical errors with these two Preston Lane uh, parcels that are outlined in red. And so the proposed action would, on the land use map, it would correct um, one of the residential parcels um, to change that to be industrial. And you can see that in the top right, um, um, that they're now both outlined in purple. And then uh, likewise on zoning, where both of the parcels outlined in red were residential, when in fact um, they should be uh, Zoning, and so that's uh, that's the requested action on those two parcels. Um, and then, in regards to CEQA, this is a, a continued slide from the last meeting, uh, stating that the proposed amendments before the commission and the city are consistent with the analysis that was included in the EIR that was certified by the city in 2021. And so, this would conclude my presentation. Staff's recommendation is that the planning. Commission review the, and excuse me, this should say ab adoption amendment hearing draft and adopt planning commission resolution 15-23 and your action then would forward a favorable recommendation to city council uh, for adoption of these zoning code IP amendments and then also the general plan LCP land use map and zoning map amendments with the appropriate CEQA finding and I'm available to answer any questions. Thanks. Cindy, thank you very much. Uh, well done. Um, Commissioners, no comments at this time, but questions for staff. Joe? Cindy, the, the, the only question I have is with respect to the uh, work live. What, what, it doesn't seem the definition says anything about, one way or the other, about additional employees in a work live situation. I, you know, everybody is, assumes that it's husband and wife or single person working and living there, but. It, it creates a different circumstance when there might be one or two or even more employees in them. Uh, so is there anything explicit that says we're, we're only talking about owner, worker? Uh, sure, so the research that we did in looking up um, other cities uh, did not um, differentiate between that. Um, and so the city of Slow and Atascadero was the was the closest that we found in terms of uh, something that might be relevant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it. Asia, any questions for staff? I think my only question is just to clarify on the zoning map, um, or I guess to reiterate, you're saying that just the layers on this printout or on the projection are um, just computer errors or like the parcel maps um, don't necessarily, the parcel numbers don't necessarily align with whatever Google Maps has. Right. Or aerial view is on there. Right, so we, um, our zoning maps and the land use map are GIS based data. We depict it over as an aerial over onto Google Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just to make it m a little bit more readable so that there's the context of that you know like what streets it is. But essentially, um, you know, it's not a dimensioned map. So we're looking at like the APN number that uh, represents the actual real property that's owned. And so that would be the action that would tell us what parcel was changed. So if a landowner has their parcel number, they could look into the zoning code or look ask office ask your office to reference it by parcel number to see what land right. use is appropriate for that. Right. And, and that's the way our map is based. Yeah. yeah. It's not based on parcel. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Mike. Yeah. And questions only, right? Chair. Questions. Okay, only. good. So I like the fact that the setbacks will be considered by the downtown design district D three, I call it. I would also consider uh, looking at live, work, work, live, 
as part of DDD because I can see that popping out as part of the, you know, that's gonna grow, that kind of development and that kind of okay. will grow and we're gonna need that uh, as part of the D3. Um, it, it, so that's a question for Scott and Cindy, can we build that in as far as what we're looking at already anyway? We've already seen it tonight or we've seen it before. So uh, let's let Scott yeah. reply. Scott. Yeah. The Planning Commission can certainly make that recommendation. Okay. Seems like a reasonable one. Give okay, it good. So I'd like Right that. in line with the things that, that downtown okay. design. And then the last one would be regarding what Betty Winhook submitted, which was unhosted hotel again. I could see that popping out as part of D3, the downtown design. So, so I'd recommend that as well. Let me ask Scott, um, if we were to make a recommendation like, uh, how would we move forward on that? You still are, have to reach out to the city attorney, mm -hmm. um, council member Landrow's here tonight, and we could ask her. She's been, I know, involved in discussions on this. I'd love to hear what she has to say. Can we make that part of this? I think I think the recommendation, recommendation would be to city council that it be included in the in the downtown design district yeah. effort. Yeah. Um, and that way, there's some more time, and mm -hmm. and we can give it the proper amount of, you know, review that it needs. Okay. Um, and again, these are all related to things that we have, you know, in the downtown area, so it seems yeah. appropriate. I mean, that they're gonna be yeah. looking at a number of, of items related yeah. to it, so it seems okay. Yeah, and just to clarify, the reason I'm doing this is because not, we talked about housing also being built in, affordable housing, uh, Commissioner uh, Asia. So what I'm saying is that there's gonna be a, a host of things that will be part of this. I'm just trying to build in more people downtown, right? When you live there, you're gonna be doing business or you're gonna be, that's gonna be part of your life every day, as well as the unhosted hotel. You're gonna build in more people there. I talked about trying to liven up the place. You know, we need to get more bodies as part of the D3. So I'm just trying to think about that now as you guys study it. I get it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Nothing from Eric, nothing from me. Um, commissioners, if we have nothing else, I'm gonna go directly to public comment. And do we have anybody who would like to speak on this issue? Terry, thank you. What a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you can only imagine my frustration having the live work mm -hmm. agendized in this meeting and part of this discussion. When I uh, spoke to the Morango Alessandro project, I expressed concerns about the live work there. I alerted staff that I was the first person to do a live work project in San Luis Obispo some 35 years ago and helped essentially write the live work ordinance in San Luis, made myself available as a resource for that. That project was subsequently approved and as I see the approval of that project and now this new language for live work, I think that the project as approved would be basically in deference to what's being proposed as live work and it's very frustrating I am currently considering a Superior Court action writ of mandate on that project since I've run out of administrative options, but it's prohibitively expensive and since I don't have a vested interest in the project other than I live in the neighborhood and I haven't been able to get my neighbors to chip in, so that's probably gonna stand and move forward. Enough on live work. Um, downtown guidelines and downtown district. First of all, I'd like to see at some point as we move into this discussion of the downtown design. I'd like to see a district boundary. I don't know if one ex exists, whether staff has created. It, it hasn't been established yet. That's gonna be part I, of I the I think that would be an important first step um, because of the nature, particularly the size and shape of the assessor's parcels in the what I perceive to be the core of the downtown, arguably um, Morro Bay Boulevard and Main, but just to pick an intersection. Yeah. Um, many of those lots are very small. I think that they will probably not be economically developed, and I say that with 50 years of development experience at my back, um, unless they're consolidated with larger parcels. Once you start consolidating lots to create larger parcels to make them economically viable, the argument would be easily made that a taller building would be more appropriate because it could be mitigated for its visual impacts much easier than a 25 foot wide building going 37 feet tall. Uh, we see this in downtown San Luis Obispo. 
there's a jewelry store that's wedged in between <laughs> two three and four story buildings that's only a two story building and it's quite hilarious because it's only 25 feet wide. Anyway, uh, when we get to the downtown guidelines, downtown district, I hope we'll start with a, a definitive plan so we know what we're talking about. And then the last issue is I currently have a tree removal appeal pending before the city. It was supposed to be heard tonight, but it's been suspended because Public Works is essentially ready to withdraw their, their project. And uh, I'd like to talk about trees when we get to the downtown discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Others, welcome. Please introduce yourself if you'd like. Steve Matthew, uh, owner of AGP, uh, co-owner of AGP Video with Nancy Castle and co-owner of these properties on Preston Lane. And I've gone back and forth with myself uh, all day and with Nancy on how to address this. I can see by what you're gonna do that it's gonna straighten it out. I did bring uh, your maps. I got about 20 going back to 1885 in my folder, but I'm gonna cut this short and, and just talk to you about the mapping itself. Th thank you. Steve, did you? So, so Steve, we need you to talk into the microphone, if you would. Yeah. I gotta get my back. Got it, got it. Take your time. starters, I've been where you guys are at and exactly where you're at because in 1995 I was on the Planning Commission and wow. we wrapped up Thank you. a five-year round, <laughs> but we took six months to do it. They thought we were going to just pass it through. We were a brand new commission. On the first night that we heard it, I had 32 items that I had gone into in depth and brought those up and Chuck Clark, who was the chair at the time, <laughs> at 11.30 said, well, I think we should probably hear this a little bit more, so why don't we? <laughs> and it took six months of uh, some special meetings and stuff to go through that whole thing again, even though it had been kicked around for five years. Uh, it was a mess. Uh, th the good news for me was 32, page 32 was only as far as I had gotten with that kind of critiquing. <laughs> and he didn't even know it. Anyway. This was one of the things that we straightened out. Somewhere in between in the last 28 years, parts of it reverted and regrettably, uh, the thing that we're bottom line concerned about because it looks like if you pass what, you're, uh, what is being suggested and just turn the two prop, the 26, 46, 56 pieces uh, into uh, light industrial, uh, what's now going to be IG, what then was M1, or is currently M1. Uh, that's the uses of those properties for the last 70 years. Okay. One of the things that crops up here, though, is something that's haunted this whole little corner uh, since Nancy Castle's dad bought uh, property 25, which included all of that that is yellow on these maps. <laughs> Uh, in 1934, and uh, subsequently traded uh, 56, or the chunk that is marked 56, for the chunk that is 46. On, and it's a duly, you know, it's all on the record and everything, in order to make 4626 a perfect rectangle, which he then subsequently sold. Uh, it sold three times, it's back in our hands, <laughs> okay. Uh, part of my whole thing there was to reconnect all of Nancy's original heritage property. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry with the Oz, I haven't spoken at the mic for a long time. 
Where was I going? I'm concerned, uh, we're concerned that these maps and the reason that this has happened is everything in the top corner uh, on the left, that area that the, the diagonal is following, following down to uh, the, the line that I drew uh, that's running from top to bottom on the edge of the 2646 property, actually as two separate county plat maps. And you have to buy both maps and put them together in order to get this to be one piece. In that, I can see that this has happened again even with the computer uh, rendition that they're not lined up. The triangle perfectly fits on the trapezoid or whatever the other so, is. So Steve, yeah. let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. And uh, My Cindy, oh, you, know, so you could stay. I, I'm trying to figure out where we're going. Um, can you, do you know what, what, we're, what we're trying to it, we, decide? It, we, we, we understand what he's saying. Um, we have um, changed the land use and zoning to reflect the things that they're interested in because they're correct. Um, they should have been changed several years ago. We agree with you. <laughs> uh, and the, one of the issues is the mapping is the way that it is in our GIS system. We um, are going to have, um, we are going to pull some additional documentation to see if we need to change the lot configure the, way, the locations of them in this area. But the APNs are, this, are gonna remain the same. They're not changing, those are, those are what they are. Um, and they do reflect and cover the areas that have the industrial use on them. So we're all on the same page with that. So what might change from what we're looking at now? There could be a little bit of a change in the configuration of the lots, um, because as um, he was indicating, they, there is a, like he, read, the one that, the one that he redrew, that he drew, hand drew on in black, um, which is on the left-hand side of the, of the sheet, um, it does look, at least towards the top of that, that that's what the lot looks like um, in one of the APN pages we looked at. So we're sort of trying to, we'll be putting that together and making that change, but it, it doesn't change the fact that that property is incorrectly land use. So from now, how do we you, proceed you would, tonight? You would just move this forward and then we'll check the, 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 uh, the, the mapping piece before we get to council. And you can communicate with Steve and we, we, we will we will do that yes. make sure it's consistent with his understanding and C correct if there's any issues um, I'm, I'm trying to see if we can move this tonight you, you, yeah. you, you can we'll look at the the, the, the lot configuration piece mm -hmm. to to get it correct um, before it goes in front of council but the APNs are correct yeah. do you have a meet, well, meet, go ahead um, do you have the meets and bounds on these? Do you have the physical descriptions? Because yes. the meets and yep. bounds will clear all this up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just suggest going straight to that. Yeah. The one thing pertinent to the APN numbers is that the section that I have marked 56 is part of 56, which is a, the property that AGP video is on, mm -hmm. okay, and is not part of the 26. So that particular APN gets cut in half almost. So do you see what I'm saying? So, the so APN goes with 56 and not with 26. So w w we can't solve this tonight. Right. But I mean, but thank you so much for but being zoning, here and making the it zoning clear. is correct. I kind of also was hoping that the maps could move forward correctly from this point on. That's that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Bottom line. That's, okay. That's the but we're staff yeah. has it covered, so we are good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And through the chair, just for clarification, part of our motion will be to have this map corrected. For council, right? Have the map corrections you, made like you can, prior you to can add it to the motion. We're doing yeah. it already. Yeah. Yes. But correct. I just noted that when that when you Cindy was making yeah. a report, she says make the map corrections. Right. Great. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you, yeah. Steve. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, staff and council. Um, I wonder if um, I could invite Council Member Landrum. Would you be interested in talking to us a little bit about the? Uh, no host hotel definition? Um, sure, I, I was just kind of thinking that when you have no host hotel in a, in a commercial district, if you eliminate it, if ever Morro Bay were to eliminate um, short-term short rentals in residential areas, then you wouldn't be complying with Coastal Commission? 
because they would be called hotels or unhosted hotels rather than short-term rentals, which they kind of are? Um, you're looking at me, so I'm going to answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, so, uh, so you, you point, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to remove short-term rentals from all residential neighborhoods in town based on previous conversations that I've had with the Coastal Commission. Whether we reduce them or not, you know, through future efforts, that might happen. Um, that's probably not an issue so much um, for this. Um, the no hosted hotel thing is different. Um, just simply based on uh, hotels are located in areas that have commercial designations. Um, you can have short term rentals in commercial areas as well though. Um, so that's the differentiation. You can't have no host or, ho or hotels in residential neighborhoods. So those can't exist there. It's not a use that's allowed in those, those residential designations. So wouldn't be going there. They'd only be located in, in commercial and visitor serving commercial um, zoning designations. So I, I'm not clear on what the difference then would be between a short-term rental in a resident, a commercial area, or an unhosted hotel in a commercial area. If somebody were to say come and, con and, and want to, they, we have many um, situations where we have residential units that are non-conforming in commercial zones, and those could come in and get a license to be a short-term rental. Okay. Okay. So you could have them and they would operate under, because they're a residential non-conforming use, they would operate under the short-term rental ordinance. Um, whereas uh, you had to have a hotel, hosted or otherwise, is gonna operate subject to the commercial requirements that we have and in the commercial zones that we have. Um, so they're not, they're not the same um, and they, you know, they operate differently in the different zones, I guess. So, I mean, you don't have, again, hotels of any type in the residential zone. So there's no other distinction between the two other than one is, could be a house at certain times whenever it wanted to be called a house in a, re, in a commercial area. Short-term short rentals are re residential units in whatever zone that they're in. And that's the only difference when you look at them. Short-term rentals operate, you know, on, with a, if they're licensed, operate underneath the short-term rental ordinance, correct? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, for offering this. Um, I think we might, well, we're gonna reconsider as we start to talk where we can put this in a way that gets adequate attention. Yeah, and I will just mention that I've done, a, um, I've sent out a survey to all of the hotels in Morro Bay and to get their feedback on this. And um, of the, you know, I've had over 30% respond and, um, of that, I would say, let's see. Um, I've asked, do short-term rentals impact your business? And the questions are, yes, a great deal, yes, not that much, no, not at all, and unsure. And 83%, 83.33% are either yes, a great deal, or yes, but not that much. So I just thought I would put that out there that it is a concern for the hotels. Sara, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let's see, Anthony and Ray, do we have anybody in the queue? Thank you, Chair Roshan. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. Okay, so with that, I'm going to close public comment. Commissioners, I think we've got our scope. Um, I think now I'd like to open it up to your comments and direction. There are certain things I would like to revisit and make sure we're clear on. And I think I'd like to start with number one, and Cindy, you can help us with this. Um, last time we did decide to uh, make the uh, recommendation to go back to the 30 feet versus the 37. And I wanna make sure Asia's had every opportunity to respond to that and um, Right now, that's included in our recommendation to city council. And so, would you like to go through that one more time and kind of make it clear what your your concerns are? Sure, yeah. So, um, I don't know, we've rehashed this a couple times and um, just trying to get, a, I guess, a grasp on uh, where we're going. And so, I think that my concern was 
that if we reduce the heights from 37 to 30 feet, that we would, and then depend on the design district to um, develop some guidelines for housing in the designated, or the parcels of question, um, that that restriction and that process would um, would end up disincentivizing or making um, it really difficult for the market to provide housing, whatever potential housing could happen in those areas. Um, I'm in full support of the design district. I think it will allow for much more um, nuanced and um, uh, place specific uh, results. And so I guess um, that my concern is just that the um, design district really look at, um, if we're gonna lower those heights, that the design district really um, incentivize not just affordable housing, but housing in general, and that, um, that as policies are developed as the research is done in the downtown design district that it can be regular, I know that's a plan, but that it can be regularly brought back to the planning commission as a point of discussion. Um, I know that it's in the city council's hands, but since we have a couple of representatives, it would be great to um, get regular reports on it. So my uh, last thought is just that um, learning, you know, that um, lowering the heights from 37 to 30 feet can still allow for additional stories, I think is a helpful thing to know. Um, because right now it seems like we have um, heights that allow for maybe two stories and that has not resulted in additional stories or housing in the area. And so I think my concern is just trying to find that balance. Like, what do we do to make sure we're incentivizing um, or coming up with a tool that actually incentivizes building housing and how do we make sure we're not just adding restrictions that aren't gonna actually produce anything and so thank you for hearing my No, of course and, and you will get more bites at the apple. So, uh, you know, this is, you know, I think Joe and I are listening hard and this is something that um, you know, will be balanced with what we're going to hopefully hear from the community. Um, there will be two public meetings with the uh, downtown design district, and we will bring it back to commission, and the final recommendations will come to commission for approval, um, I think before they go to council, right? Or how will that work? Mm -hmm. so very good question, Chair Russian. Yeah. Um, so it'll be, it'll really be whether and how it moves forward will be up to the um, the sub, this council subcommittee. Um, and my guess is they will, um, assuming there's some sort of effort and direction that comes out of the downtown design district, um, council members Landrum and Edwards will take that back to the full council to get their sort of blessing to move it forward through the normal process. Normal process goes recommendation, if it's an ordinance, say, um, would be recommendation from Planning Commission to City Council, not unlike you're doing this evening. Um, and so that's probably how it would work. It really is up to the subcommittee to move it forward or they could choose not to move it forward. Um, it's gonna, it really is up to the, to the council subcommittee on, on how that and where it goes and how it goes. But right. So I'm just wondering if, since you guys are our representatives in the, um, subcommittee, can we create spaces on a more regular basis, not just the, the community meetings, but as a planning commission to comment on what you guys are working on? So um, I'm a bit concerned about that. Um, I think, Scott, if we brought it back here and had discussion, that could be a complication. Um, because w right now, um, there's two of us involved. If we go to a third, that creates... No, I mean like as during a planning commission meeting, like no, get I an know. update. I'm so so I, will, uh, I mean, I can weigh in on that if you, if you don't mind. So Please. about the extent of what 
um, the planning commissioners that are on the, our advisory to the subcommittee, which is um, Chair Roshan and Commissioner Ingrafia, um, they could certainly provide updates about where we're at, but you would not be able to deliberate that um, unless it was a, a, a noticed public hearing. And that would really be outside at least the current framework that we're, gonna, we're operating under. Now that framework could change once the, we've had a couple of meetings, I don't know, but it's not currently anticipated that we would be doing that. So, so updates I know are possible, but yeah. the, my hesitation is deliberation is a different so how can other planning commissioners um, submit inquiries or information or ideas to the subcommittee, just as residents or citizens? You could provide information, commentary to me, <laughs> and I could do that. It would be, you, you, can't, you can't do it, but you could do it with could kind of come up with a format where you could do it with one of the commissioners, but you can't do it with, with both, with two of them. And um, not more so than because one. It's, yeah, because that yeah. becomes a yeah. Brown Act issue. And through the chair, Would ultimately it's, if we follow the process, it's gonna come back and that's gonna be your big bite at the apple. So I know that's such back, a shame though, because you might, yeah. there, it's gonna be a big piece of work. Yeah. That's gonna it's take kind of the way committee structures work. Yeah. It is and the well, nature of it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So tough, ready, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but okay. um, let me say thank you very much for being willing to take it on again today, mm -hmm. yeah. because I do think that's helpful, and um, I do understand where you're coming from, mm -hmm. but I also like the fact that you're willing to sort of support the effort uh, mm -hmm. to see where we could get and can we, can we do it well, so. Um, any other comments on the uh, height, Joe? Yeah, I, I, I might add, no, I will add, um, that with the current 37 foot height maximum, one would be hard pressed to say that anything specifically is incentivized or not incentivized. That's what we're really dealing with, is to attach some constraints and some incentives to get what we want and not to get what we don't want. And right now, that's not the case. Yeah, and it's, it is about housing and it's also about the character of Morro Bay. So that's the balance. But I appreciate that. Let's keep going. The setback issue. Commissioners, are we pretty clear um, what staff is saying around the setbacks? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> let me just say it one more time. Cindy, Scott, make sure I got it right. We're looking at setbacks that will, will be adjusted in the zoning code uh, recommendations immediately around the project we just saw, right? you are gonna make recommendations around that one project that will be part of the um, recommendations? It, it, it moves forward as it, as exists right now. I mean, yes, okay. I mean, that's not, yeah. So, that, so as it's, it, this was already been adopted by the city council, right? And then yes. it, it came up as part of a project and you were like, yes. wow, we're not sure we like that. Yes. Fair point. Um, we haven't made any change to that. It's moving forward like this, and then you're gonna talk about it as part of the downtown design district to see if there are changes that we wanna recommend, looking at the whole area um, that would be affected by changes to it. So, so. And so this is one more responsibility for the 3D mm -hmm. that will take a look at that, and because the setbacks are much more pervasive than just that one area. C correct, yeah, you, you, you run down the street going south um, on, um, what is it? Moro? Moro, sorry. Uh, and yeah, there are there are different structures, especially on the east side of, of Moro that have you know differing setbacks that we would potentially be making non-conforming if we applied, say, visitor serving commercial um, zoning to it, which has the larger setback. So that's why we need to look at it. Commissioners, any comments? Mm -hmm. uh, item three, the visual resource protection plan. Any comments on that? None. The LED lighting, do we want to include that comment? I have just a quick comment based on what's on page three here. Um, it says uh, in the third line, should be revised to reflect lumens or color temperature. And I would say that that word or should be an and, should be re revised to reflect lumens uh, and color temperature. I, but, I agree but, with that. Okay. But, but the, the essentially <coughs> your, your your quick note, which you had in a little red line on the on the overhead earlier, 
was essentially saying, you know, warm light and low lumens. And it, I, I'm, I don't necessarily need for us to decide what is warm light and what is low lumens. I think that staff can, can develop that, but the intent is it, it be, you know, 4,500 isn't necessarily warm. 3,000 is warm, 2,700K is warm. Sometimes people refer to 4,500 as warm, but it's it's neutral, yeah. and and that's a subjective, debatable subject. But th that we could we, we can get it going. Just we with need the to make end. sure that that goes forward <coughs> All right. okay. as separate, not as one common thing. It's not an or. Um, I'm good with that. Any any concerns? Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is the live, work, work, live thing, and um, we're right now suggesting that would again become part of the 3D mm -hmm. effort. And you know, thank you, Terry, for uh, you know bringing your voice to it. But we're probably going to have to keep trying on this one under 3D. Um, commissioners' comments. Mm -hmm. Go right well, my only thought is if that kind of the implications of where the downtown di design district boundaries are, because there's all sorts of non-downtown areas that might be like industrial areas that might be implicated in live work. So I'm not saying we need to like absolutely define it, but. No, um, that's a good point. So how would you, how would you handle that, Scott? Well, I mean, the intent, my understanding was to develop a, a potentially, potentially develop a, a definition. Again, we don't have. Citywide. Yeah, city, that would be citywide, but I mean, because you're looking at things in the downtown, it's appropriate, and mm -hmm. I mean, if this body can do it. So we would just use the downtown as the test point it's for a citywide definition. Yeah, I mean, and we are, and in, in I think to Commissioner King's point, I, we are looking beyond just the downtown area, you know, uh, from a connection standpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, being respective of the things that are around it as we inform what happens in the downtown design district. So um, it does, just by its nature, require us to look outside its boundaries, so. It's the same situation with the word on Osted Hotel that, that exists outside the, the downtown. Yeah. yeah, we're getting to that. Yeah. yeah. So I, Joe. I, I wonder if we could just hear from Terry for a moment since he's familiar with the slow situation and if they address the idea that I brought up of additional employees in a work uh, live situation. But was it non-consequential? They, they addressed it, forgot about it, never considered it, what? Recognizing that this was 35 years ago, but <laughs> my best recollection was, and project specific to the project that we developed, was the intention was and the use of the space was that you lived and worked in that space. You didn't have employees coming in. You didn't have customers coming in. This was primarily, the project started out as one giant artist loft, 3,500 square foot artist loft. We broke it up into four individual lofts and allowed living in there because it was in a commercial zone. Do you remember, was there a, re a restriction on, a dif on additional employees? Because quite often a small business will have someone else joining the team? Um, I, I really, I, I looked at what staff pulled out of the city's live work ordinance. It seemed to be fairly specific to not having outside parties, at least in San Luis, involved in the, in the work part of the live work. But that's just my recollection of what I read earlier in the weekend. Okay, thank you. But our specific project, which drove our starting the live work movement in San Luis was specific to the tenants in the space were allowed to work in their space. That was the driving factor. So, thanks, Terry. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna say let's keep it with 3D. Um, yeah. I think I feel good about that. It, it does have language, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Relation. it does have language that, re that refers to that, so uh, Mr. Simons was correct. It says, you know, it says working space reserved for and regularly used by one or more uh, occupants of the unit. Mm -hmm. So it's not super strong, but I mean, it does seem to indicate as, yeah, it does. as, as uh, Mr. Simon says, that that's the intent. So. And I, I would just add in, it's, it's really not too dissimilar to the city's home occupation requirements in the zoning code that um, going from memory here, I think um, don't allow employees because the idea is like, you know, home occupation, you're living and working from home. If this is just, you know, more of a live work, is more of a 21st century. Yeah. version Got of that. Okay, yeah. final comments? Yeah, Eric? and just for clarification, I was assuming that these kind of places would pop up in D3, the downtown design district, because they're allowed. 
right? And, and we're moving towards mixed use. I haven't heard the word mixed use at all. That's all we see in the Bay Area is mixed use, which allows you know, um, retail, whatever, commercial, housing, all in the same place. So all I'm saying is that the, the downtown design district should be as flexible as possible for all of these uses where appropriate, where the law allows it to happen, and including yeah. housing. So I've been thinking about this a little differently in that um, I've been thinking not just about like the home occupancy sort of setup, but actually a more maybe, I don't know if industrial is the right word, but more of a um, opportunity to have housing and shop space that has uses that, this is why I'm not sure it's appropriate for the downtown design district, because there's um, more um, like handcraft or um, like shop style work that could benefit from, you know, owner work spaces that might not be office specific and, and, and might definitely have an employee or two. And so uh, does that make sense? Like I could foresee, even like the past project we've seen, I could foresee a transitional industrial area or light industry area where something like welding is permitted or some kind of mechanic sort of work is permitted on and someone lives. I think I think that's a little different. That's called work. Li that's called work live. Right. Uh, so that's live why. And that's why I've been fighting for the two different definitions. The definition of work live in my mind has been in areas that are industrial to allow people to live in their industrial units, but it allows you to have more intense uses that you would see in a light industrial type right. area. Would and you see that in, in parts, parts, parts of cities. You see that in Little Italy and San Luis, which is also known as the Broad Street Corridor. Yeah. Uh, and they have work live sort of situations there as differentiated from live work, which is not typically light industrial. It's typically pretty quiet and it's typically no employees. Uh, and, right. and its primary use is, is residential, and it's in a, a zone that's either residential or adjacent to, to residential. Yeah, so zone. staff, do you want to comment on that? I mean, I think we're not trying to resolve it tonight, but I think we're trying to get confidence that this, that we can we can get to a good place with 3D. Yeah, I, I do agree with Commissioner Meyer on the work live piece. We did we did find you know a couple of you know uh, definitions that reflected basically what Commissioner Meyer was saying that you have this sort of oftentimes larger spaces you would have potentially have employees there. Um, and then uh, we have the ability for someone to live in the space. And typically, you know, it's the single family type thing living in the space, adjacent sure. space. If you're looking at like Preston Lane, we were looking at earlier, that's a great place for, for you would think, for work live or certain portions of Quintana where H&L machine used to be back in the, uh, the, down in the little industrial sections mm -hmm. on Quintana would be a great place to have right. work live. Uh, it's not the best place to live because it means that there's someone using a grinder next to you at an odd hour. I mean, it is an issue. I was wondering because in some of those industrial uses, allowing for residential does become, you know, a Well, they, 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 the, the, the way you do it is you, you, go to, you, you basically make the residents, you know, sign a document, that's, the owner sign a document that says they, they know they're in, a, in an industrial area. We did it in San Luis when I was on that commission. Uh, maybe. <laughs> and and, and in some of these industrial or like district commercial C2, they're allowed to have residential security units. So if you're a welder and you need to be on site because you have high value inventory, like that's already allowed through our current zoning code, we would just, you but know. It's defined as a security? Oh, well, in our current, in the in current. old code, in the new code, it's called a caretaker unit. Primary use is also the industrial use, and right. the secondary use exactly. is the residential. And so yeah. That's, yeah. that's basically how you establish the dominance. Yeah. yeah, which ergo is work live, because the primary use is the I get it. Yeah. custom welding, for example. Okay, so how do we want to handle this? Um, we can keep it with 3D and have further discussion. And or, uh, I mean, I, I think we would like to move this tonight yeah, and I like that suggestion because the council shares the 
you know, the subcommittee or the committee. Yep. So you could get that dual input. And I think what, you know, what Eric's talking about, we can easily bring in mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll, we'll try to see how we approach it citywide, mm -hmm. even though, you know, work live is not part of the downtown design district, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I think looking at both is probably not beyond the capabilities of the downtown design district uh, group. And I think the good thing is, you know, if we come up with policy language, it has to come back here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we, it, we it, get another swing it, at uh, it. The Planning Commission has to review any ordinance changes to the zoning code before it goes to city. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, technical errors, we heard from Steve, you guys are good, and you understand it because I don't quite understand it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. It's, it, it's really the fig configuration of the lots. Yeah. yeah. And, and we emailed uh, Steve and Nancy around 4 o'clock today to tell them basically what was discussed nice. tonight. It and sounds like a GIS issue primarily. Yeah. And, and we did already email GIS late this afternoon to um, get some clarification. Nice. CEQA, are there any further e issues with CEQA that we need to determine this evening? Covered under the original EIR for Plan Morrow Bay. Okay, commissioners, we're good. The last thing I have down here is the non-hosted hotel definition, which again, we're, we're pushing off to 3D. Um, and one reason I wanna do that is I really do wanna hear back from the city attorney. Mm -hmm. And uh, also maybe we do a little more research to sort of say, I can't believe no one else is yeah. dealing with this. And as part of that, Mike? I wanted to add a little. Yeah. To unhosted or non-hosted, whatever you call it, signage. Because we haven't gotten away from having to, we did it tonight. There's signage gonna be part of that. Yeah. So signage should be part. We're either gonna do it or we're not. not but if we don't do it, we gotta be consistent. So let's signage. suggest that, um, and this is something the commission's brought up before that when we get a proposal on a project, even though signage is uh, maybe handled more in building and safety, um, we're asking for signage and lighting and landscape to all be submitted um, as part of the proposal but for commission review. That's good, we, we, it's, it's required in the new code. Okay. okay. Is public art part of that requirement? We have no public art requirement in the city's policies. Yeah. Yeah. But this will be part of 3D, right? Uh, a chair. So this, but we're, we're saying unhosted or non, non-hosted, and signage will be covered as yeah, part of that. Yeah. Thank we're we're going to call it the Eric Commission. Okay, good. <laughs> I think we're good, um, commissioners. Last chance. Mm -mm. Are we all as happy as we're going to be? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion if we're ready. Please. Sure, I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Commission approves zoning code, coastal implementation amendments, and the approval of change in the land use map and zoning map included in the GP, LCP for parcels, APN, et cetera, and the Planning Commission adopt uh, resolution 15-23, making the necessary findings for approval of MAJ 23-004 with the noted, you know, comments. Are we good on the noted comments? I can go through them again if you want. Um, I mean, I think we both took copious notes. I have them actually down here twice, so I think I'm thinking. good. Yeah. Good. So we're talking about um, 37 is going to 30. Mm -hmm. We're talking about setbacks will be handled through 3D. Mm -hmm. We're talking about visual resource protection plan is as described. Mm -hmm. LED lighting will uh, have the, uh, the addition that Eric put with an and rather than an or. Live, work, work, live, which I'm grateful for the discussion tonight. I think it was helpful. Again, will be a 3D concern and we'll see how far we can move that. Uh, the technical errors, we had a great visit with Steve and Cindy and Scott understand exactly what he wants. And, and then also correction of the dog beach parcels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. CEQA mm -hmm. has been um, accounted for at the previous meeting and the non-hosted hotel definition again will be a 3D, uh, part of a 3D exploration. Yeah. Including signage, signage requirements, if at all, will, will that be a so far, we've required no, signage. signage is right now, there's no. For unhosted. It's In other words, are we gonna have at least. I mean, it would be part of the submittal requirements for any commercial development. Okay. Yeah, but not part of the zoning code. I don't think we're taking that on. Okay. 
three D will handle it. You guys will. As it. the definition. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that I made that motion. So there's. Do we have a second? <laughs> I'll second. Yeah. Right on. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Mike. Final comments, commissioners. Would you poll the commission, Cindy? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Yes. Commissioner Meyer. Yes. Commissioner King. I'm sorry, no. Com Commissioner Ingrafia. Yes. Chairperson Roshan. Yes. Motion passes 4-1, thank you. Commissioners, thank you very much. Good work. Um, I'll go on to new business. Do we have any? No, it's not, it's not, I don't know if this is new business. It's just from, yeah. from, from time to time, uh, suggestions come up about good ideas that should be further examined. So I, but there's so much work to be done that I realize these don't always get onto the agenda. But I'd like to just mention them as a reminder. So can I, can I do that? Please. So um, one of them is that with respect to the renewal of leases on the Embarcadero or new leases, there's a, a policy uh, at, at the Harbor Department, I guess, to maximize the leases as they come up. And I wonder if we should examine that with a mind towards some of the properties on the Embarcadero, which we should consider in terms of preservation rather than demolition and maximizing the value of the lease. What would the vehicle for that be, Scott? Well, that would be having a city council member to champion that idea because that is not the current process. <laughs> and what would they be a champion for? Um, having the Planning Commission look at anything related to leases on the waterfront because that's handled through the Harbor Department and the Harbor Advisory Board. Let's drill down a bit more. Okay. Um, we, we're not just looking at leases. What would we be well, looking at? Again, I'm, 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 I'm talking about a policy that says that the primary policy, I believe, is to maximize the lease when renewed or a new lease is renewed. It's, that's fairly stated. Yeah. I, I, I would just suggest that when we discuss on the historical preservation ordinance that that ordinance could take this into account and then through that process of that ordinance being adopted it would include by its nature all parcels in the city and so thus perhaps i'm not sure that so, so the good part about some of this and maybe this is not where you want to go but um you know we have to do historical evaluations so anything that you know, some of the stuff that's recently gone out to RFP for redevelopment of the lease sites. Um, it's no different than any other property in town that's over 50 years old. They have to go through an historic analysis to determine historical significance and those types of things currently. And I think in the future, if we're able to put together a, you know, a um, historical uh, ordinance, which is part of our goal, so we're supposed to do that, um, it could be incorporated into that as well. But uh, at a minimum, you're going to be getting that type of information related to any project that proposes demolition of structures that are older than 50 years. I think Joe's comment is bigger or broader. Right. It that. was actually beyond the notions of historical significance. I was thinking in terms of uh, the, the culture and the uh, uh, iconic appeal of Morro Bay, in particular the Embarcadero, depends on some of these structures, and they may not have historical value based on a famous person or a prestigious architect, but nevertheless, they have this iconic appeal. That let's, let's try this. If, if the Planning Commission wanted to begin to um, have perspective around some of these uh, policies, what would be the best way to do it? Where we don't overstep our influence, but we do bring a level of, whether it's preservation or, um, or you know, uh, icon making, image, character defining considerations. Our, our, yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, our policies require you to make the request of city council for you to work on things like that. Um, there's multiple lanes here and, you know, overlapping jurisdiction when it comes to some of this stuff. So. Um, it would be so let's say we find a champion. What would be the best way to do it? You can make the request of city council. You could do that through a letter through the chair. But I mean, what would we be requesting? Uh, would we? How would we interface with uh, the Embarcadero? Well, I, I think when, I, when, when, when I'm yeah, when I'm asking about the letter, I think you probably want to put down specifically what you want to do, so the council could give consideration to that. Maybe just as simply in the form of a bullet point list of things you'd like to consider, and then that's easy for the council to consume. 
um, and then, you know, then they can see what they want to have you work on, and then we can move it forward from there. Commissioners, uh, a shaking of heads, do we like this? And i just like to comment, I think that's how 3D got started, right here. So yeah. that's similar, we could start. I, I have an alternative. Okay. I don't know why I didn't think of this. Uh, we're gonna be updating the waterfront master plan oh. <laughs> as well. Okay. We just got authorization from city council to apply for a $500,000 grant to do that. That might be the perfect vehicle. <laughs> and how would we, I guess that's my question, how would we interface with the master plan? We, we could, we could uh, ask for a role um, so we, we, we have talked um, with the council and we'll be revisiting it um, with them about uh, forming a subcommittee and, and moving that forward. That's a, that's a future agenda item for the city council. Um, and one of the things I asked is it would be nice to put stakeholders on there, including a couple of planning commissioners, Harbor Advisory Board members, Maritime Museum folks, Embarker Darrow, Master Leaseholder folks, mm -hmm. fishing folks, um, that type of thing, and coming up with Got a it. committee that could inform not only the uh, RFP that would potentially go out for it, but just be part of the working group as we get information and, and you know work on the on the overall. So um, again, I think we're all nodding up here, and um, I think the perfect person to begin this is Joe. If he could put together those bullet points so we have a, uh, an opportunity to have an informed um, discussion and ask of, uh, of council how we might fit into the planning process. Mm -hmm. That's yeah? great. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank we, you. We, Joe, do we have your commitment? <laughs> sure, sure. And I have a couple other thoughts. And again, let, Keep me, going. Let, me, and, and let me say it again, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter to me whose purview this is, whether, I mean, it does matter. I mean, I wouldn't mind if it's not the purview of the uh, Planning Commission. These are just some thoughts I had that somebody might address and think about. So the, an, another one is um, w when um, uh, uh, mature, um, sizable trees in, in the uh, right away and uh, healthy trees are removed because they're disrupting some of the sidewalk and curbs and, and, and probably the thought is that even if after the curbs and sidewalks are repaired in short order, a few years, they're going to be causing damage again. And so the tree might, it might be, I'm not even, I believe there's a policy, but sometimes a healthy tree is removed for that reason. And we might want to amend the policy so that we place a monetary value on this large, mature, healthy tree. So when we're balancing that against the cost of doing those infrastructure repairs, we have a, a fair analysis of economic gain and loss. Again, I, it strikes me that that might not be the area for the Planning Commission, but maybe it is, I don't know. Okay. All the street trees right now are regulated through the city's public works department. Um, the policy related to tree removal um, in the right of way is, uh, is conducted through them. Interestingly enough, I think as you, Mr. Simon said this evening, uh, uh, the, appe the appeal process when the appeal tree does go to the planning commission yeah. though, so <laughs> it's kind of a, you know. That's, that's what got me started on it because at, at the first glance I thought clearly it's public works but then we're involved in the appeal process. Anyway, yeah. and the third thing, and I won't take any more time other than that is, if, if you recall, the, the notion of junior aid, ADUs came up and yeah. there was an in lieu fee for, for, for houses of 2,500 square feet or more, there is an in lieu fee or you could uh, build the ADU. Well, if, I mean, when it comes down to practicality, nearly everybody will offer to build the ADU because it becomes part of their property rather than the 25, the, the money going into a general fund. And so I think we should ex examine that because I, I don't think it's a reality that money is going to be contributed to the in lieu fund. And, um, and, and very often these ADUs get designed as part of the internal structure of the house and for all practical purposes look no different than an extra bedroom. How would we or a maid's, a how, maid's um, Scott, how would we, yeah. isn't that more of a, of a staff evaluation? I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the ask is here, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not uh, sure either. Let, let me, um, an, an applicant will, you know, proposal will, will say that he is building an accessory, a junior accessory dwelling unit. Now, presumably, that's 
going to be available as additional housing, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, the way it might be designed, it's in internal to the house, there's a common hallway that connects all the properly designated bedrooms as well as the junior ADU, uh, and it becomes essentially a maid's quarter or an additional bedroom or a guest bedroom, and never is there any likelihood that it will become anything resembling additional housing. Um, and that's because, because uh, it's incentivized. Why should I pay a sizable in lieu fee when I can build an extra bedroom and that increases the value but of my home, et cetera, et cetera? Just, just so we're all on the same page here, that was the intent of the ordinance was to have ADUs created. We don't fully want the in lieu fees. We want the units. Just what, what just I, I guess my point is that I don't, I don't it's very unlikely that it turns out to be really an accessory, accessory dwelling unit. That's what I'm, I'm saying. It turn, it'll, it'll be a, a guest bedroom, yes, but not an, not an. Um, I, so, like one way to remedy it might be to require a separate ADU. Yes. yes. My only argument is that for the J ADUs is that it actually probably encourages multi-generational households, which you could think of as um, additional housing to some degree. I mean, think Absolutely. of all college students. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's certainly a real thing. Mm. Okay. Well, that's an interesting consideration. Yeah. That's like the, like how we've seen it so far, but. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to place this on our agenda so we can have a discussion about it. It's, it's an interesting topic, I you know, but it's up to the commission. Well, let's do this, because I have one more too that I'm gonna add to new business, which is um, <clears throat> we've seen before, um, the uh, deferral of sidewalks. Mm. And <clears throat> I've uh, had some conversations with Scott, Scott, and I've also talked with the city attorney about the idea of rather doing deferrals, doing in lieu fees for sidewalks. And that way we could actually allow public works to prioritize where the sidewalks need to go. And that also means that developers um, don't get away without paying the you know, the, the fees, they're not deferred, We're, we'll put them in a lieu situation. Uh, Chris, our city attorney, felt it was possible. Mm -hmm. Scott, I'd like to suggest that for the next meeting, we agendize, um, uh, Joe will be prepared for the harbor master plan and how the role that the uh, planning commission might play and I'd also like to agendize the, uh, the city sidewalk in lieu fee idea okay. and see if we can make a recommendation to city council. A question about that. Please, go ahead. When does the city circulation element come up? It was adopted in 2021 with the, with the, with the adoption and approval of the city's general plan. It would seem like the sidewalk discussion might be a part of the next circulation element update. I update. think you, you work on this and then you figure out how to do the priorities, right? Yeah. And just clarification to the chair, our next meeting is the 17th, which is two weeks from now, so I wanna make sure Joe, uh, Commissioner Ingrafia has the, you know, the deadline, can do this before, you know, Scott wants it sooner Joe, rather than Joe it. always delivers. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I just wanna make sure, because it's fast. I mean, we've had three meetings in six weeks. So. Um, and I, I think these discussions don't have to be long. I think these are set up to be um, more like a, a, uh, an update. And so um, I guess I'm asking for both the, uh, how, we, how the Planning Commission might interface with the Harbor Master Plan as an exploration based on Joe's considerations. And if we could agendize the in lieu fee for sidewalks um, and I don't know if we need something specific from city attorney, and also I'd love to hear from public works. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to have them at the meeting, but we'll see. But let's at least try. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get somebody here, agendize it anyway, and we'll- No, no, we'll put it on the agenda for sure so you can talk about it, and uh, I'll see what we can do from the uh, public works side of things. Nice, I like it. Unfinished business. You get to comment or future agenda items, commissioners. I think we've done a lot of commenting. Um, community development director, comments? Um, there's gonna be a um, meeting on offshore wind 
County Government Center, November 1st, four o'clock, sponsored by Congressman Carbo Hall, uh, Assemblyperson Addis, uh, and Senator Laird. Um, it's gonna be have a bunch of uh, experts on offshore wind, stakeholders, so um, if you're able to attend, um, probably be a good, good meeting. County Government Center, 4 p.m. What's the date again? November 1st. November 1st. It's a Wednesday. Okay. And then on November 2nd, we have our public 3D meeting. Mm -hmm. it, would, it, it would be totally appropriate for the commissioners to, be, to attend that meeting. Well, our, three, our, our first meeting of the committee is just that committee. No, the November 2nd is the public meeting. Oh, the public meeting, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah that's the, yeah, correct. Right. So I'm encouraging yeah. you guys to consider that. Do we know yet what time it is? We haven't, uh, we haven't picked the time yet. We're also looking at uh, options for a couple of the facilities, whether it's gonna be here or at the community center. Uh, any other comments, commissioners? If not, I'd love a motion to adjourn. So motion. moved, second. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Zara.